when you were making albums like The Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, Animals, uh, The Wall, when you are making those albums, did you think, oh, this is everlasting stuff? I don't think you think about that when you're a kid in your 20s, you know. Longevity in pop music, in, in the terms of me as a 20, whatever, I was 27 year old when we did Dark Side of the Moon, was measured in maybe five, possibly 10 years. When you went in to make Dark Side, did you, did you have it envisioned at all? And, oh, we're going to make this big political, philosophical, you know, what it, what it became. You know, I can't remember the exact point where things changed. I mean, as soon as Roger came in with the idea of its central themes of how the pressures of modern life can affect your sanity, um, it started taking a shape from then on, I would say. And, and what was the, the mood of the band then? Was it, was it a particularly magic time for you guys? I, I can't remember it as being anything out of the normal, you know. Um, it was, we, we were working hard, we were getting on with this stuff, and we were coming up with tunes that we really liked. It, it felt good, but it, 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 that feeling that, that we're onto a real magical something came a bit later down the line, I think. I wanted to ask you if you would just talk a little bit about Nick Mason playing on, on, on Dark Side, because he, all those drum bits are so musical. They're so, they fit in. It's not just someone keeping time. This is a whole different kind of thing. Um, you know, what can I say? Nick is the guy who's, who's our drummer. He's the right guy for the job. He, we couldn't have wanted anyone different, better. If you take Nick out of the combination, it doesn't sound right. You know, you, we can play comfortably numb with the best drummer in the world, and it sounds great, but it doesn't sound quite right. One other question about Dark Side, the heartbeat. Mm. W did that, was that a finishing touch, or was that thought of well in advance? I think that came in mm, quite a while before the end, and is done on a tom-tom. It's not a real heartbeat. Right, but You'd be in deep trouble if that was your heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> when Pink Floyd puts out special packages, one always feels like they're really special. I mean, there's a lot of attention to detail. For the first time, the concert screen films are being made available. Yeah. I have to tell you, as a fan, I have always wanted to have those concert screen films. Yeah. All this stuff's out on... on a lot of it anyway is out on bootleg but is in such rotten quality that if they're listening to it anyway in shit quality why not give them it in in the quality it was originally recorded in i'm going to be looking through it all myself so when it some of it i haven't seen let's talk for a moment a little bit about storm thorgerson if you could just talk a little bit about him because he's created special booklets and prints and collectible postcards and uh, of course he's been a big big part of the band's history if you could talk a little bit about him. I've known Storm since I was 13 and he was 15 and he always talked too much. Nothing's changed. <laughs> I had no idea you knew each other that long. Yeah. Um, we used to hang out in a place by the river in Cambridge. When I, when I, I say when I was about 13 and he was 15. When I joined the band he asked me if um, I could persuade them to let him and his other people who were in this. They had a kind of a collective company called Hypnosis. And, uh, you know, he asked me back then in the beginning of 1968 if uh, he could have a crack at the cover for our next album that we were working on, Source Full of Secrets, and uh, I suggested it to the rest of the band, and they went along with it, and he's kind of been there ever since. Before we got into the next bit, I, I wondered if you might play just a little bit of Breathe. <laughs>
I wanted to ask you about Richard Wright's contribution mm -hmm. to the dark side of the moon. Well, it's you know it's hard to separate Rick's contribution from one album to another. You know, Rick is a vital, important part that adding part of the whole tonality and the whole emotional depth into into what's going on at, at, at any given point. And he was certainly in there on that. I mean, he brought in the music for The Great Gig in the Sky, which was a piece that we were going to use on, on this Zabriskie Point film with Antonio a few years before. Rick's contributions throughout the years have tended not to be as noticed as perhaps the, the, the jollity of Roger, Rogers and Mine's arguments <laughs> throughout the years. But Rick's role in it all was very, very important. And even if we as well sometimes um, allowed ourselves to stop noticing how important that was, it, um, it was something that came back. You can't actually pin down what is and what isn't Pink Floyd by the people who are in it. It's, so it's, it's every one of us, every one of the four of us is kind of a vital part of the, of the mix. And you're deluding yourself if you think anything other than that, of course. You can take that on into the moment when Roger had gone and uh, we had to persevere without him. Um, and you can say something's lost, but certainly something was gained as well. Can you tell me a little bit about us and them? How, how, how that, you know, how Richard had that music? How did that, how did that come about? It was a piece of piano music um, that was on, you know, that we, had, he must have written before, but we recorded on just a piano. Or in Rome when we were recording for the Zabriskie Point thing. Um, I think we used it in that film on a riot scene at, at, at uh, West Coast University, at uh, Southern University of Southern California, I guess. Um, and there was a riot scene going on, lots of slow-mo film and police beating students with truncheons. And we thought it that quiet, beautiful piece worked really well with it, but Antonioni didn't think that the juxtaposition of quiet, beautiful sound with this sort of rather violent action going on was, was, was quite right. He wanted something with a different mood to it. So we, luckily, he didn't use it, and luckily that left it for us to use on Dark Side of the Moon. You make The Dark Side of the Moon, you realized all your wildest dreams, fame, fortune, one of the biggest selling records of all time, one of the greatest albums of all time. And then you go into Make Wish You Were Here. What was the, the mood of the band then? Were you all thinking, oh, this is great, we've got it down, we know exactly what we're doing, all engines full steam ahead? No, very much not like that. <laughs> we were clueless for a long time. We were faffing about blindly trying to find a way forward and uh, that sort of uh, blindly wandering about not knowing what the fuck we were doing was what helped to create what came you know with shine on your crazy diamond and the whole of that wish you were here album so how, how and that started quite painfully it was difficult and we didn't know what we were doing but it by the time we were adding in those um, other songs, Welcome to the Machine, Have a Cigar. And we were working on all cylinders, I would say, by then. So, and so how did that album come about? Like, what, what, what were the, the, what songs came first? We worked in this rehearsal room in King's Cross in London, shitty little hole, like the black hole of Calcutta. And in that room, we came up 
with what became Shine On You Crazy Diamond, um, Dogs and Sheep from the Animals album. Those three pieces were what we had worked up and were working on. And Roger, particularly when he got to the studio, wanted to drop the one that became Dogs, which is called You Gotta Be Crazy at the time, and the one that became Sheep. And I didn't want that to happen, and we had some arguing about that for a while, but uh, he was right and I was wrong, not the first time. And um, we went on with Shine On You Crazy Damn and split it in two to open and close the album. It seemed to work. The famous cover of the two businessmen shaking hands and, and one of them's getting burned. Did the band give Storm any specific direction? Well, Storm came in, as he would, on every album and spent time with us while we were recording and would talk to us about what the album was about and what we were trying to get to. And as the sort of theme of the album was absence, Storm went away and thought about absence. And so you have... Um, a person swimming with an absence of water and a, a body in a suit with an absence of the body and a person diving into water with an absence of splash. If you wouldn't mind playing those four magical notes. So when I first heard Welcome to the Machine as a young man, I thought you were really singing for me, for all of us. I wondered, perchance, if you were also singing maybe a little bit for yourselves. Did, did you feel you were perhaps trapped in your own machine? Yeah, I think, I think you'd, you know, you'd have to ask Roger, really, but I would say yes. I and mean, we are just the year before, you know, two years before, hit the big time, if you like, with... Uh, um, with Dark Side of the Moon, that meant having a lot more contact with the machinery of um, the rock and roll business, with meeting all the people involved with it, like your good self, and some people a lot less salubrious. <laughs> and um, we had become a much bigger business, and their eyes were opening up, and um, you could see this... Um, wanting to participate in our good fortune look in people's eyes. So much of Wish You Were Here is, is theater of, of the mind. You know, in Have a Cigar, the music gets gobbled up, it gets a swish comes, then all of a sudden it gets tiny. You know, maybe we're thinking it's coming out of a transistor radio. In uh, Welcome to the Machine, the music goes into an elevator. What's the process of, of those kinds of theater of the mind uh, affects if somebody just say, ah, I've got it, let's make the music going into an elevator and we'll just... Yeah, that sort of thing, you know, and um, what can, how, to, how do we make, you know, with, with a recording desk and a couple of little old synthesizers and stuff, how do you make that sound? And you have to throw yourself, in, your imagination, into creating, because it doesn't sound like an elevator, really. It's making noises that make you think it sounds like an elevator, but it's not. There's sort of low tones on the synthesizer going... Mm, mm. But elevators don't make that going up noise. It's an auditory trick. But it's not remotely accurate. But it works. But accuracy wouldn't work. 
how did how did you uh, come across the, the the music for the song "Wish You Were Here"? It's a, it's such a lovely piece. Did, did, had did, had you had that b- before this time, or I bought a twelve string guitar of a guy I know. I think I'd recently bought it off him, and I was strumming it in the control room of number three at Abbey Road, and that just sort of started coming out. That riff. Um, and a bit like the beginning of Shine On with those four notes. You know, I started mildly obsessing with this riff that was slowly developing. And again, people's ears, Roger's ears, pick, pricked up and he said, hmm, what's that? Where's that come from? Um, and I had a terrible habit of, uh, of playing bits of songs by other people that were good. And Roger would say, yeah, that's great, let's use that. And I said, can't, this belongs to someone else. <laughs> uh, so he got a little nervous about asking sometimes. And I think he was a bit nervous about asking in case that came from something else by someone else. Is it, is it fair to say that your guitar skills uh, went up another notch? Not on the recording of the beginning of Wish You Were Here. <laughs> Every time I listen to the actual original recording, I think, God, I should have really done that a little bit better. But I mean, the idea was that it was like... Um, a guitar playing on the radio and someone in their room at home in their bedroom or something listening to it and joining in so the other guitar was kind of supposed to be a kid at home joining in with the guitar he's listening to on the radio and therefore it wasn't supposed to be too slick and it wasn't The Wall, the ultimate concept album, is a total movie in your head. Are you aware that Comfortably Numb is the most played Pink Floyd song? I wouldn't be surprised, but um, but I didn't know that. In the United States, since 1980, it has been played 330,000 times. How did you come to write that, and how did you come to write what is now this historical solo? The piece of music that became that I wrote when I was doing my first solo album. Um, And I wrote it at uh, Super Bear Studio in the south of France, which is where we later recorded a lot of the wall, but I did a solo album there, and Rick had done a solo album then for me. Um, And I think... I think its genesis was actually that um, my friends who were in the band Quiver with Sutherland Brothers and Quiver, who had a hit with the Arms of Mary. Um, They were working at Abbey Road with Bruce Welch as a producer, who was one of the Shadows. And um, he wanted to double track an acoustic on something of theirs, and he said he wanted to use a high-strung guitar on that. And uh, my friend Willie, the drummer, um, was in that band, and he said, yeah, told us to use this high-strung guitar and double-tracked a a regular guitar with a high-strung guitar. And I said, well, what is a high-strung guitar? He said, well, it's one with higher strings, you know. And he wasn't very very clear on it at all. I had no idea what it meant. So I got an Ovation acoustic guitar and strung it up with all unwound strings, but put six unwound strings on. And um, the top two strings were normal. Uh, The next three strings were an octave high and the bottom string was two octaves high and I started strumming chords with that guitar um, and found that you could be very lazy. If you have an open acoustic guitar and you strum a D chord on it you can't hit the bottom string because it's an E, a big loud open low E. But if you do that on this high strung version um, it just sounds great. It's got a ninth note pinging away in it, and so, and the, it felt like the more fingers I took off this thing, the better the chords started sounding. And um, I later found out that it was nothing like what people called a high-strung guitar. It's my own invention by following the advice of someone who didn't know what they were talking about. But um, and th- that was the tune I wrote on it. 
um, and I, I was just reaching the end of mixing my first solo album and couldn't quite be bothered to work on that one and write words for it and finish it and add it in, luckily. And so it was going spare and um, Paul Bezrin got me to play it to everyone, that and uh, what became Run Like Hell. What about the solo? Do you hear sort of a solo that you want to play and try to recreate, recreate it or do you just sit down and play and the notes kind of drop out? Do you have it's, a process? I don't have one process, I have a number of processes and one of them is to um, just pick up the guitar and play and see what comes out of the very first take and often quite a bit of the substance of it will come out of the very first take and see what you're doing. Sometimes I sing to myself over it and then try and play what I've been singing and sometimes I just try and work it out all the way through. What, what was your process for the solo in another brick in the wall? That is, that is such a specific sound. The, the sound of it uh, was this gold top Les Paul Ezrin wanted me to um, play it direct inject, i.e. straight into the desk, without amps at all. stuff um, and um, after I'd recorded it they liked it Bob really liked it as it was but I didn't think it had an, quite enough meat to it so I persuaded them to let me run it out through a DI box backwards into an amp in the studio off tape and then so it would come out through a guitar amp and we added the guitar amp sound a bit to the DI sound and also, um, that, that's the guitar that played that, played that yeah. solo, and that's an original, what is it, 1955? 55? Yeah, 55. Um, as the music grew, um, so did all of the Pink Floyd stage production. Yeah. And I wondered, when you're dealing with that extravagant of a production, does it make playing easier? Does it make playing more difficult? You have to have teams of people who know exactly what they're doing, and you have to have a lighting director who's in charge of all those sort of things so that you're not on the night. I mean, through all the rehearsals and everything, there are various, you know, you take much more part in all that stuff. But on the, when you get out onto the road, you've got to not be, have to worry about any of that stuff. You just got to get on with doing what you're there for. And that stuff all got a lot bigger after Dark Side of the Moon, when we started playing really big places and stadiums and so on. It, we, um, you didn't have the screens showing you know the players playing in those days and we were pretty boring to look at anyway and we just thought that we should create massive spectacles that people could be watching while they were listening to us so and that sort of grew and grew and grew but when you're playing a show that's happening around you do you do you need to pay attention to it in a certain way or do you just play the show and everybody else does the hopefully it just gets on with it. The people who know what they're doing, know what they're doing and get on with it. In the wall, it was a bit, little more technical. Um, there was an awful lot of synchronization going on. Um, so that meant that one, well, I, particularly for me, on the wall shows that we did, it was really pretty complicated and tricky to keep with it, particularly for the first few shows. I had the whole show written out on a huge long piece of paper. It was hanging back there somewhere with all the notes for what had to happen next, all the way through. You know, more than any other band, when one listens to your music, you feel like you're not alone. You feel like somebody else is feeling what you're feeling, and you guys were never afraid to sort of put that out there. But when you put those kind of messages out there, was that ever scary to you? No, I think people want to share, um, they want to feel that other people have felt the things that they have felt you know, and that they can, other people can describe and uh, comfort them by being part of a sharing experience, you might say. Well, David, thank you for your time and for all the great music over the years. I get the feeling there's more to come. I, I hope there is. I hope there is. Saturday night, the 